Hey, GovCon Giants family, Eric Coffee here, and today is episode 101, and we're filming this. I'm actually filming it as I'm uh, discussing this. There is no script. Uh, we are just having a conversation today to reflect back on 100 episodes of the GovCon Giants podcast. That's right. This is a reflection of the past 100 episodes, and I can tell you for those of you who don't know the story, let's just, you know, we'll just jump right into it. GovCon Giants podcast. What we do here is we help everyday people win extraordinary contracts. And how we do that is in a couple ways. The first thing that we do is we provide content online free to all persons who want to make the time to consume that content, to learn all about the world of federal contracting. And we do that through a couple of means, one being the podcast that you're listening to now, and the other YouTube if you're watching this online. So um, exciting stuff that we've done. And it's funny because not that long ago, right, just not that long ago, we were only doing the YouTube videos. And I learned how quickly you could multiply your results by adding another medium out there, and that's the podcast medium. I originally started out and I wanted to do podcasting. However, I did not know how to do it. So I was clueless, like, how do you start a podcast? And so I watched my favorites like Pat Flynn, John Lee Dumas, and I watched them do it, listened to a ton of podcasts. I was a fan of podcasts myself. And so in listening to them, watching them, learning from them, I bought a course from EO Fire, John Lee Dumas, uh, once I was able to bring someone on, Maria Martinez. You guys know her as my resource specialist, former resource specialist. Uh, when I brought Maria on, I said that this is something that I really been wanting to do and I wanted her to help me with it. And so she was the person who actually took the course, uh, went through the lessons and was the first one to actually help really just put the whole podcast thing together. And so I want to thank her for that being instrumental and in actually studying and learning all the steps to do a podcast. And then I also want to thank John Lee Dumas and Eo Fire because they were the ones whose course that we followed uh, that we are now and done more than 100 episodes successfully and has brought in our horizon in terms of opportunities for ourselves and for others. So I can tell you the d fundamental differences between a podcast and a YouTube channel is that with the podcast, uh, because it was such a new form of media and um, it really allowed me to target and talk to uh, other professionals in my industry that otherwise I would not get a chance to talk to. Uh, you know, in the beginning, when I first started this, uh, everyone was scared to go on video. So we'll just go back to like in the very beginning. So you'll see my first 20, 30 episodes, like no one was on video. Only the guys really uh, were on video. The women were always reluctant. They always wanted to get their hair done or make sure that their makeup was proper, or make sure their backgrounds were set up accurately, correctly. And so really it was just the guys who were the ones that were getting the actual, we're you know not afraid to go on camera in their face. The thing about it was uh, with the YouTube, it was content that I was creating myself. So I had to sit down, sketch it out, map it out, you know, write down this content. And I was the one making all the content. And it was my thoughts, my ideas. When it came to the podcast, I was able to harness the power of other people's thoughts, other people's ideas. And I was able to bring in technical experts in the field who were the best at what they did. And without having a podcast-like platform, um, I, I was not able to do that. I would not have been able to do that otherwise. It would have been a, a much longer journey to get people to understand, especially because in my industry, the the persons that have the most experience typically tend to, tend to be the older persons. And so they're more of the baby boomer generation. And so again, for the most part, people see YouTube as a place where people play and have fun and not really as a serious uh, way to market and build a business. And so again, uh, with that, it would be much more difficult uh, and challenging to get those people to come on and talk to me about it. However, 
using the podcast format, I was able to ultimately leverage really what was a format that was very similar to radio, which people were used to, they were accustomed to. This is a format that people are know. It's been around forever. Before there was TV, there was radio. People listen to baseball games on radio. So a lot of the baby boomer generation, when you made that comparison, they understood right away what this was. And then having it accessible on everyone's telephones, right? That also led to the credibility of it um, and having platforms such as Google and Apple, um, having those other platforms cre- have podcast sessions that you could see on your phone. So it was easy for us to say to someone, go to your phone, go to podcast. If you had an iPhone, there's an actual podcast app that was pre-installed on your phone. You could look at Spotify. People, Most people had listened to music, so they listened to Spotify. Uh, and again, then you had iHeartRadio and things that people were already familiar with. So all of those things led to credibility with my audience. So I was able to leverage that to get these spectacular people to come on and have a one-on-one interview with me and open up their experiences of what it was like to do government contracting from the ground up. And let me tell you, it was it's incredible. I mean, it's it just, I cannot believe how there's not more people doing this for their respective industries. You know, it's just remarkable because as a result of some of the people that I've met on the show, we've now formed relationships and partnerships and we're doing business together, we're doing deals together. And this has helped probably propel my business more than anything else that I've ever done. So while the YouTube channel allowed me to reach a huge audience, a wide swath of the audience, the podcast is where I form my partnerships and my relationships and where I'm now doing all of my future deals. It's been uh, incredible to say the least. And I can tell you that right now, where I'm at today, two years later, from where I was at two years ago, is leaps and bounds. I'm able to, using the podcast platform, I'm able to now leverage working with really, really large organizations. I'm able to now leverage partnerships for my students. I'm able to now leverage alternative learning formats for my students. Uh, People are wanting to help provide content for me. People are wanting to write articles for me. People are asking to be guests on my show. And people are wanting to uh, get access to our tens of thousands of students worldwide. So that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, And all that happened because of the podcast. So now let's go back and actually I want to talk, you know, briefly about some of my guests because we've had some incredible guests on the show. And so I really do want to talk about some of the guests on the show and maybe um, let's just, you know, talk about some of the stories relating to some of the guests. And it's funny because, again, when I'm looking on the screen, let's go back to pull it up on the screen. Here we go. And let's look at episode number one, Nargis Ali. Man, Nargis, um, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, being my first guest ever and for believing in us. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is Nargis' story of an immigrant coming to this country and her actually turning into a NASA award winner multiple times over uh, her partnering with someone who actually uh, went to space, an astronaut, and, you know, the person, uh, you know, passed away on her. Um, but her actually being able to do that, coming over as an immigrant, is the story of so many of us that come to America and are looking for opportunities. And I think that because of her background, because of her story, is why she actually took a chance with me and gave me that opportunity. And so I want to thank Nardis for that. Believe it or not, I was able, I was at a conference for the Hub Zone Council, and Maria and I actually went to go meet Nargis. So we actually went to her offices and we met with Nargis in person. And so I was able to take a picture with her, which is really cool, which is what you see on the screen. So I think that's really neat that, that we were able to get a picture together and we were able, I was able to sit with her, chat with her, meet with her team. You know, she was able to tell me more about her business. And so Nargis actually was the first person to give me an opportunity to come on my show and agree to be my first guest. Now, actually, 
if we go back, step back, a few years before we released the podcast, I started interviewing SB Award winners uh, because before, again, like I before I wanted to, before I actually did the YouTube video, I wanted to launch a podcast. And so I actually did some interviews prior to that. So if we want to be technical, we did, I do have four or five interviews that I recorded prior to this, but Nardis was the first one that was in the podcast format that we then went off to launch. Number two was Robert Wink. Robert Winky, as we call him, Winky. Uh, Robert was a former contract specialist with FEMA and U.S. Army Corps Engineers. And Robert is a really unique character. He actually uh, was still working for the government when he came on my show. And one thing I like about Robert, he was almost kind of a like, rebellious kind of guy, which I loved about him. He had written a book on government contracting. And so he was a very rebellious guy. But I can tell you, in his episode, you know, we talk about following the FAR and the regulations. And Robert shed some light and insight as to what, how things are actually done versus what they say they're done. And so I thought it was really cool. Um, and he was a very strong-willed person. And I thought it was cool how he was able to, you know, kind of open our eyes up to saying that, you know, things are not always what they seem. Things are not always done the proper way. And so Robert opened up my eyes to that. Linda Rawson, number three, Linda Rawson, Linda uh, she, uh, let me tell you, Linda's, um, her spirit, uh, and I connect. It was so funny because if you ever seen that movie, Cool Runnings with the Jamaican bobsled team, Linda actually hosted them at her house, uh, a Jamaican bobsled team in Utah. And so it was really cool. Linda also wrote a book on government contracting and she was a 8A person. Um, and she shared some, some stories and some ups and downs about the 8A program. And so she was the very first one to come in and talk about the good and the bad of, you know, having an IT company and being on GSA schedules, having FTEs and things like that. So again, I love that some people have contrary views to what people see this as just a golden ticket to a whole bunch of money. Linda came in and she, again, having had the presence of writing a book on the subject, much like Robert himself, which I have both of their books back here. You know, she came in and she was, you know, she opened my eyes to some contrarian views about what it looked like to have FTEs and also IT companies and what that experience was like, because she she did it and she lived it. Uh, and then coming from Utah, being a whole, you know, very far from the Beltway, we discussed things like that as well. But a really fun fact about Linda was that she hosted Jamaica Bob Slip to her house. Jennifer Danvar, number four. I think it was... Um, it was this year, uh, yeah, this year that was, it was two years later from the actual date of recording my podcast that I actually got a chance to meet Jennifer in real life. So uh, Jennifer and I actually met and she worked for Lidos. And if you don't know Lidos, Lidos is the number one or, or number two largest federal contracting company in the world. Uh, just depends on the year and I'm sure how the contracts shape out, but she works for the biggest that's right. The biggest uh, federal contracting company in the world, Lidos, and she does capture management. And at the time, I really didn't know what capture management was. I mean, I did capture management, but I didn't know what it was called. So she was the first one that hit me to the word capture management. And I thought that was incredible that she taught me that. And she works on some really, really big projects. Her husband works for a top DOD contractor as well. And we discussed all of that on the show. But she talked about what is the process like going after contracts at the big level, right? So at the highest levels, what is the process like? Well, that was episode four, Jennifer Danvar. Really, really great person. Got a chance to meet with her in person, have lunch. And so we we hit it off. And hopefully in the near future, we can do some business together. Still haven't made it up to that level yet where we're working with uh, Lidos. But like I said, you know, when you do things like the podcast, the people make opportunities available to you. So she, you know, she told me, hey, if I have anything that we could bring to the table, she would introduce me to the players there. So again, you cannot, you cannot buy that. That there's no price tag to that. I'm sure there are thousands of entrepreneurs that want to do business with some of these large organizations, and they're like, they have no way in. And so to have a, a platform like this where I can set up an interview with one of those organizations, and then that gives me a vehicle to go in 
to them is just incredible. Uh, number five, Angelo Byrne. Angela, man, oh man. Angela is actually uh, originally from Colombia. She's an architect. And her company that she took over and she ran, in this particular story, I, I oftentimes tell people that if you're looking to do business international, this is the episode that you want to hear, right? Number five, Angela Byrne, because Angela won, at the time, the largest contract for a woman ever. She was on the largest IDIQ for a woman-owned business in the history uh, at that time. And I, and I don't remember the numbers. I think it's somewhere around $500, million, $500 billion the IDIQ was. I don't don't quote me. It's listen to the episode. Uh, but she won the largest ever contract for a woman at the time. And she started doing international work. And she's been working in Africa and Afghanistan and all over there. And so it's funny when you see this person, Angela, and you, you look at her picture, it almost doesn't match to someone who's doing government contracting uh, overseas. But again, that's why you can't judge a book by its cover. So it's when I if someone is wanting to do business, uh, international. I always encourage them to listen to this episode because she joined some international organizations for federal government contractors and took some trips overseas. And then she was able to land her first opportunity as a subcontractor and then eventually a, a prime contractor. And then she started her seeds started sprouting up all over the place. And so, again, just like uh, my guest, Roberta Moore, on a more recent episode who started off internationally, great way to start. Uh, episode five with Angela Byrne is the one I listened to. Episode six, Matthew Schoonover. Matthew Schoonover is uh, the first attorney that we had on here, and he actually is a, been on a couple times. Uh, at the time he was on, he was he was working for a different law firm, and then he went out and started his own law firm. And so, what's great about this is over these last few years, I get to see how people evolved, right, in their journeys and their stories, and not just. You know, they get to see how I evolved and where I came from, where I was at two years ago. And it's like our life is on public display. And so with Matthew and this particular episode, uh, we discussed joint ventures and mentor protege program, which still is always a hot topic. But when he came back on the second time is where we discussed what it was like to actually own and operate your own business, right? You Now you are a lawyer working for a firm, and then you come back and you actually uh, start your own firm and what that challenge was like. So in this particular episode, we discussed joint ventures and managed a protege program. And believe it or not, the rules continue to change on that. So this is why I'm going to have a job for a really long time. Number seven, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gabriel Ruiz. And Gabriel, actually, uh, it's funny, he's, he, he's really down the street from me. He's just up the road near Orlando, and he does IT. And I love it because, again, he's another example of someone coming to this country and taking advantage of all the opportunities they were afforded. And so his organization, we're working on, a, I'm working on my fourth book, right? And so on this next book, where we have some of our podcast guests um, write stories and give their input. I remember Gabriel telling uh, Randy, who's helped me organize the book, he said that um, he was working on this huge contract. It was like a billion dollars or something. I remember, and this is this is why I say that like these people have personalities because he says, I'm working on this billion dollar uh, or so via contract. And he says, if I win that, I'm going to be in the cover of Eric's book. And so that's just to show you the kind of personality that some of our guests have. I think that's just wonderful for them to feel that way and to believe that. So I want to thank him for that. Now, moving forward. All right. Number eight, Michelle Burnett, my girl. Michelle, 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 Michelle. She was actually the first a uh, person to come on our show who actually represented a national council that supported small businesses. And Michelle was part of the Hub Zone National Council, and she is a firecracker. She is super, super passionate about that council and what they do for small businesses. And let me tell you something. If you've ever been around Michelle, if you've ever been in a room with Michelle, she's got a big personality, and she is going to talk everything Hub Zone. She sends people to Congress to testify on behalf of the council. She, when we're at conferences, she's playing uh, House Senate meetings on the TV show, watching people speak regarding the council. She's watching as the House and, and Senate are voting on issues related to small business contracting. She 
is in it to win it for small businesses. So again, if you're a HubZone organization, definitely um, Michelle Burnett is the one that you should be talking to. And you know what? She helps advise, counsel, and match make for people for free because she just has a heart of gold and that's what she does. And that's the person she is. So I thank Michelle for coming on and being number eight on my episode. Number nine, Darcella Craven. Just like Michelle has a passion for HubZone, Darcella has a heart for veteran-owned businesses. And what she taught me about VBOX and how they're set up, they not only do they help veterans, but they help families of veterans. So again, these are resources that we talk about that are free or low-cost resources that are available to everyone out there. And Darcella actually is the head of a regional area that covers multiple states. So again, when we talk about what are some of the resources, and I see my book down there, like the Billion Dollar Playbook, uh, we mention there are resources that are free and low cost available to small businesses, but unfortunately, we don't know what to Google, so we don't know how to find them. But in this particular episode, Darcella shares resources for veterans, which I love. By the way, going back to Michelle and relationships, this year, GovCon Giants became a 501 C3. And I was going after this veterans grant program. And I was able to ask Michelle for a reference for GovCon Giants and myself for, uh, for what we've done over the last several years to help small, promote small businesses. And Michelle gave me a reference. So that's just incredible. And that shows the power of what uh, a podcast like platform can do in terms of connecting you to people and places that can help you go further in your journey and help you reach your goals and get closer to where you're trying to be. Uh, number 10, Karen Vieira. Karen is a doctor. And what's really cool about Karen was that uh, we actually went to the same school, University of Florida. And not only that, we knew some of the same people at University of Florida. I was uh, my first company. I was in a, um, one of the guys on my board, Dr. Arnold Hegestad. He um, he was on my board of advisors for, for one of my very first startup businesses. And Karen was in class with this particular guy's son. He has since you know left this world, got rest his soul. But I mean, just it's amazing because Maria was the person who actually scheduled and found all these wonderful people for me. And I had to do the research to learn about their businesses, about what they did prior to actually interviewing them. So Karen Vieira was... Uh, was amazing because her company, uh, MedWriters, actually does, they write proposals, they write contracts, they write grants for other people, and they write for government as well. And um, what's, again, what's interesting about that story is that I moved recently over here to Palm Beach County, and uh, I got a chance to actually meet Karen for the first time in real life, probably, you know, this year, 2021. So that was, that was super awesome that we met. We hit it off right away. We had already been keeping in contact because she also teaches. Uh, so she's on the teaching circuit uh, when she's not running her business. Well, she's got people running her business now, which is amazing. That's the goal for everyone out there is to have other people that, you know, you grow your business up to, you do all the hard work, you put the right people in place, and then let then you start managing the business and you're not having to worry about the day-to-day operations. So she put that in place. And um, so she's able to actually go out and speak. And since that time, we've done a couple proposals together, going after some opportunities for teaching and training. So it's just been an amazing ride. My man, Donnie Harris. Donnie Harris, first contracting officer that we had on the show. So it's great. Mr. You know, Donnie Harris came on board and uh, he just really dropped a whole bunch of jewels. If you've not heard a contracting officer, this is one, and he had an unlimited warrant, which meant that he could spend $100 million assigned to a contract and be liable for it. And he talks about how does it mean for you to pass the mustard test and what are some of the tricks that the government does in terms of the RFPs and write-ups to disqualify businesses, not just small businesses, businesses together as firms are following instructions. Uh, so again, if you have not heard of an episode with a contracting officer, This is the one to hear. My man, Ashley Bell. At the time of this interview, Ashley Bell was the regional administrator for Small Business Administration, um, but he then moved up to be the entrepreneur and advisor to uh, former President Trump at the time. And he has since gone on to Greener Pastures and is now uh, working with an organization that supports Black-owned banks. And so it's just incredible because 
Uh, we actually, I've ran into Ashley a couple times in public, a couple times in D.C. Uh, he's introduced me to some of his friends in the capital world because I wanted to do a small business lending. And I keep bumping into him on our path. It would keep crossing. Uh, we haven't found anything that we can do together. But it's just great to see his journey and to see how he's evolved and where he's gone. But uh, in this particular episode, which I think is fascinating, is listening to uh, a region administrator for the Small Business Administration and what their thoughts and ideas are on uh, how the 8A program at the highest levels, uh, how, you know, what kind of plans they had for growing that program, building it out, and ultimately helping small businesses. Number 13, Orlando Espinosa. Orlando actually has ran a whole bunch of national programs uh, with his company, m and Media. And also, he's ran a lot of training, teaching, curriculum style for uh, SBDCs, uh, MBDAs, um, and you know other nonprofit, other city, state organizations, teaching small businesses, teaching different types. I mean, he's taught hundreds of courses and programs. And so Orlando... You know, he comes from uh, a background of teaching and training, curriculum writing. And so it's just incredible to to see how he's able to, you know, help. And, and for me, even still help to create programs and curricula all around the subject of small business, from finance to accounting to estimating and building a business, you know, social media and things like that. And so uh, he's a force to be reckoned with. And, and today, him and I, along with Karen, have gone after uh, some projects together and we're continuing to work together. Number 14, Beverly Kai Kendall. So it's funny, you know, I met Beverly when I first started my GovCon journey back in like 07, 08. And she was the first person that I met at a conference. And so interesting enough, Beverly and I met, you know, probably, I don't know, nine years prior to this. No, it's 2019. So let's say, yeah, yeah, actually. So we probably met 11 years prior to that interview and to see where, again, at the time I was a newbie and she was working um, for a company called Trimco as a consultant for small businesses and to see uh, how she went from that, uh, moving from California all the way to Florida, actually in Broward, and then helping uh, AMD Medical uh, secure billions of dollars in contracts. I thought that was just amazing. Actually, we were both speaking in Broward. She was the keynote. I was the little note. (laughs) <laughs> no, but I actually, she, I mean, she commanded the room and she's an incredible presence. And really for, for many, many, like probably a good year, that was one of my, the the most favorite episodes by all of my students. So if you have not heard that episode, listen to it. Um, I, in fact, I just recommended Beverly's episode today to someone because she talks about how sometimes it's easier to go to the front door than the diversity door. She also discusses why it's important to meet with senators. Uh, and your Congress people, and let them know what you're doing in the world of government contracting. And she's the only one out of a hundred people that have ever said anything like that. But she's also the one that's the only person that's secured billions of dollars in contracts for her company. So I think there's something to be said. D. Kivitt. Um, D. Kivitt, I can say she's definitely underrated in the industry. She's helping uh, manufacturing companies become certified to be able to qualify to do business with companies like Boeing to sell parts. And so, if you know, if they are manufacturing components, uh, she talks about what is the requirements to to have your machine shop uh, so that you can become a supplier or vendor or reseller to companies like Boeing and Lockheed. And, and if you make aerospace parts or car parts and then kind of with a, a, a interesting twist, Dee's family um, is part of the whole NASCAR family. And so she comes from a family of um, people in that industry. So I think that, that um, for those people that are in quality control, this would be probably the episode for them to listen to. And those people that want to get into manufacturing, um, finding out why is it the government pays $250 for a boat versus $0.75 cents for a boat. You know, a lot of times the news likes to glamorize these things, but really there's a reason to it. And it all comes back to documentation, accountability, responsibility, and then the safety of, you know, our war combat fighters. So, you know, for us, it's really interesting to to hear that from someone who's been an industry veteran. And not only did she, she, she does this, she actually teaches it at the university level as well. So she's totally ingrained. She is, like they said, the queen of quality is what we call her. 
Janetta Brewer. So it's interesting, uh, Janetta, I've, I've seen her now um, since she's come on my show. Uh, she had just recently left the government, started her consulting firm. Um, and I see her everywhere now. Janetta's everywhere. Um, but she taught us was how policies shaped that um, affect government contractors and small businesses. And so she was part of that process of putting together the policies uh, that would shape the contracts that we tend to look at. And so, again, getting a, a an expanded scope, an expanded view of how this whole wide world of government contracting works from different folks, different people's perspectives because, and different people's experiences because we can't possibly know all this stuff, right? Even the people who actually, the contracting officers, they didn't really write that contract. The language and all that stuff came from somebody higher up. And so they're just really uh, enforcing it and putting it in there. But the policies and the rules and all that stuff, the FAR, those things, people like Janetta and her team are the ones that are driving that home. Episode 17, Alex Hernandez. You know, interesting enough, Alex and I, we kind of actually were doing contracting at the same time. When I was working for an 8A, Alex was launching his business. And I ran into him at a SAMI event, Society of American uh, Military Engineers event down in Miami, South Florida. And uh, he was, again, he was a keynote speaker. He was the main sponsor. And I, I approached him and I asked him, hey, you want to be on my podcast? He said, yeah, sure. Reach out to my secretary. We I exchanged cards and Maria set it up. And next thing you know, he's on the show. And uh, what I love about Alex in this episode is that he uh, not only does he talk about his construction business and how he built it up, he talked about the viability and long-term success of for himself and his family, and that instead of just working and building uh, structures and buildings for the government, you know, he took that same skills and talents and started building buildings for himself. And so he became a, a landlord, a real estate investor, and a developer. And so I think that that's great because... You know, we want to, we all need like sort of an exit strategy and we need a long-term game plan for how we're going to take our, you know, our highest potential earning years um, and convert that to long-term investments that will be able to take care of us as we go into our later years. So uh, Alex showed that in this particular episode and we discussed that, plus how a former Marine built a $50 million construction firm. That, that, that kind of helps too, right? Charles Jones, my man, Charles Jones out of Baltimore. Actually, Charles is the first one to introduce me to the book behind me. Um, why should white guys have all the fun? And so Charles actually introduced me to this book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? Um, Reginald Lewis and how he created a billionaire, billion dollar enterprise. And let me tell you why I am thank Charles for this book. Um, as you can see here, Charles is a Baltimore native. I uh, started doing commissaries. But this book... This particular book, actually, it mentions how this particular attorney started buying companies. First, he was advising um, companies because the government, the SBA, and, and I didn't know this. And Charles, I don't think when he recommended this book, he knew this either. The SBA had programs back in the days for working with minorities. And Reginald Lewis was helping advise minorities and these large companies on the contracts for setting up partnerships with minorities. In fact, this is something that they did back then. This is something that we could reuse that playbook, and that's what allowed a lot of the companies from, um, and again, I think this is the 80s, uh, to have partnerships with some of the largest organizations in the world, and those you know, Black-owned businesses ended up becoming you know, successful, thriving organizations because they had capital, they had like joint ventures, they had capital, and they had the the experience that they learned from these large organizations. So I don't know if Charles told me that, but this was in that book. And I can tell you, I've learned a lot. And I'm in fact, I'm applying some of this playbook to my own personal journey, my own story as well. So thank you, Charles, for introducing me to that. But in Charles' particular story, he does commissaries um, where he's actually the person that re uh, restocks the commissaries. Um, and he does that in several contracts around multiple states. And so again, people say, I, you know, that's another thing that when I, you know, my experience in government contracting was always construction. And so people are always like, Eric, well, you talk about construction all the time and you're, you know, you're the construction guy and they're right. And, you know, when I look back at it, it's true. So 
having the podcast platform allows me to talk to people who are in other industries, other types of services, uh, off, maybe they sell products that are different from what I do. And so that's another benefit to it is that we can show those type of industries to other people. Uh, Vicky, so I don't even remember how I met Vicky. I think that she approached me online. But I can tell you that since the time that we've met, we've never lost contact. We actually communicate on a regular basis. Uh, she's started her own YouTube channel and she's over in Italy doing U.S. federal contracts. She has helped several of my international people learn about contracts. And so if you're an international person living in a foreign country wanting to get registered and do business with the government, Vicky is the person to help. And uh, she's I've helped make connections for people all over the world um, to Vicky. And she's been able to help them get registered and start doing business with the government because that's what she does over in Italy. Elliot Branch, super, super smart gentleman, taught me about SES. I didn't know what SES was. Former director, contracts, Naval Sea Systems. Uh, been in the role for a long time, doing this 30 plus years. And we, in this conversation, we were able to discuss what it was like federal procurement back then versus today. But also, um, what do you have to do as a small business to stand out? And I think more than anything else, this is a really undervalued episode because he talks about some of the things that a small business needs to stand out. And if you're, you're listening to a former director of uh, contracts for Naval Sea Systems Command, I mean, this that command is... Uh, again, Navy, DOD, the DOD spends the most. And then within the DOD, you've got the Navy that's probably close to the top of that. And then Naval Sea Systems Command, I mean, you just, a lot of money. And so having seen that and been a part of that, I think was fascinating. And I caught him just as he was retiring. And so that's why he was able to come on the show. So it was great to have him on. Thank you for that. Um, Patricia, and you know, Patricia, she actually, uh, Patricia and I, much like Alex Hernandez and ourselves, ran the same circles back in uh, 2008, nine world of government contracting. Patricia and I actually were in a SBA 7J classes together. She she sat like two people behind me and uh, she didn't remember it. And I reminded her and then she goes, I think I remember your peanut head. She didn't say peanut head. I added that. But uh, she did say she thought she remembered me. Um, we've run across each other at several public zone council conferences. I was able to meet some of the people that, you know, when she first started that talked to me about Patricia and really some of the fears that she had of, of networking and getting out there and letting people know who you are. But Patricia, she's from Dominican Republic. And uh, what's, you know, amazing is that she has her faith that she operates from. Um, she actually quit working her job um, at probably the worst time in the world where, the, where there was a recession and started her business because she believed in faith and it was the right time to do it. Uh, we both come from the same, you know, parts of South Florida where, I mean, we really, her office where it was located was very close to my offices. Um, and so we were both working at Homestead Air Force Base, but she just grew really, like she just snowballed and took off and, and really blossomed and blew her business up. And, you know, she, she, she's the woman she's, you know, she's, she like, it's her stuff. And, um, she's doing, um, I think at the time she was doing about 30 million a year. And with offices in Puerto Rico and New Orleans and other places. So, I mean, again, just really a fierce woman, one to be, you know, just, you know, just look up to. And I think that, again, um, you know, we've got some other women in the construction industry, definitely an inspiration to those women coming behind her. And her story is fascinating. Mama, you. So, again, if you know South Florida, you know, University of Miami, they call it the U. Um, so that's Mama U. But uh, that's what she likes to be called. And uh, she has a, a staffing business. And it's, you know, she's been rated top in her area for many, many years, won a bunch of awards. And, you know, it's it's just fascinating to hear her story of how uh, she didn't have all of this before and what it took to build it up. And and she, like she said, she was hungry and she wanted to eat and she had retired and she had any money and she had some grandkids she wanted to see. And so she started her business later in life. And I think that's just goes to show that resilience is is more important than age. And um, she's got a bunch of principles that she, she lives by, she follows. And she actually posts on LinkedIn every week some of her principles that she, she you know, some of the principles she follows. She's referred me several books that are excellent that I, um, I've come to love and adore. 
and I thank her. And so definitely this is an inspirational one, faith-based, uh, you're a spiritual person. Definitely encourage you to listen to this particular episode of Mama You, and also, you know, running what it's like to run a staffing business. 23, Maria Martinez. Uh, so it's great. I brought Maria on to talk about uh, landing her first uh, client and winning two projects on a sole source. Uh, again, remember, Maria is the one that started this. And, uh, she, you know, she had been working with me for probably about a year and a half. Finally, after several kicks in the butt from me, you know, decided that, you know what, let me get out here and do this. It was just great to have her on sharing her story. And since then, she's been the inspiration for hundreds and hundreds of small businesses after her to coming on the show. 24, Dr. Crystal Nario. You know, uh, the, again, I can't say enough, you know, logistics, staffing, and uh, medical firm, you know, it's just medical logistics staffing. She, um, you know, it, it's one of those stories where I remember her saying she did not believe she was ready and someone else believed in her. And I think that that's a lot of us, right? A lot of us maybe can't see in ourselves what other people see in us. And so she was literally forced to start her business, but people already believed in her and knew that she had what it take to do it. And so uh, it really just took someone to, you know, to push her out there and make her do it. Alexander Hassan, um, he taught me, Alex taught us about uh, Defense Acquisition University, DAU, which is the school that all the contracting officers go to to learn about federal government contracting. And so uh, in this particular episode, he talked about the, the, the contracting officer, but not just the officers, uh, what their, you know, what it was like for their contracts and how they were written and how they were shaped and structured. And so really, I learned a lot about risk and how contracting officers view risk and how those the reason why they write the contracts the way they do. So if you're curious as to why they write contracts the way they do and how so, this is the episode for you. 26, and I'm going to speed it up because I see that I'm, I'm only on 26 and I'm about 45 minutes in. All these stories I think are such great stories that I kind of like, I feel like I don't want to pass over any one of them. So uh, this may end up being a two-part episode to close it all out just because um, we're only about a quarter of the way through. David Ramajan, my man David, you know, out of Chicago area, built up a construction business, was the first one that told me he maximized his 8A. He came in the ground running, started off with partnerships, and then just kind of ballooned from there. Construction company, 8A. Jennifer Schaus, I always looked up to Jennifer. She was on YouTube teaching federal government contracting before me, and she has on the absolute best, best speakers, the best of the best in GovCon period, hands down. Um, and she does a lot of training and webinars free every week coming out with episodes. Angela Terry's SBA contracting manager, just uh, an incredible person we met at the Hub Zone Council where Michelle Burnett invited us to speak and have a podcast. Angela talks about SBA subnet, which we just discussed online and um, shed some light onto what's behind that scenes, the program. Pierce, my man Pierce came on and he's since then has started working with me. Um, but this was how we introduced a new product or idea, the technology to the DOD. Came on, shared a lot of good things. We've got some toolkits and stuff that came as a result of that. Amber Hamlin, Senior Product Manager at Collins Aerospace, the largest company that provides aerospace parts, equipment, uh, contracts for the government. And she's just a really nice person that wants to help small businesses. And a lot of people, she says, are just not taking advantage of their SBLO, small business liaison officers, which that's the equivalent of an OSTABU, but for a prime contractor. So um, just a really nice person, shed some insight into some of the things that you can do as a small business to get your foot in the door with large companies. Rafa and Renona, two of my students that were able to use the um, VA Veterans Employment Track to pay for their government contracting course. Uh, we talked about that in that episode. Dr. Robert Wallace, uh, technology CEO, public speaker, author, consultant. Man, he's written about five or six books. He's got three or four businesses that are all doing over $10 million. Um, he partnered with a company out of the Philippines, learned about some technologies out there. Just a go-getter, not afraid to do it. Was introduced to me by Charles Jones. He knows the story also about Reginald Lewis because uh, out of Baltimore, just a great guy. Uh, Loris Martin Rosa. Uh, Lord is actually uh, with spearheading the American Express Open White Small Business Task Force has done more articles, videos, pictures, 700 plus uh, appearances um, with American Express over a multi-year period. 
uh, teaching small businesses when the, they were trying to put together the women-owned programs and make them work. So she was interested in that. Emily Harmon, uh, former director of Navy Office of Small Business Programs, great person to know. She now has her own podcast out that we've talked about. She's been on my show twice and really just, again, an all-out wonderful person. And this particular episode talks about how small businesses can uh, help themselves. And so definitely wait and look for. Uh, episode 35 was my interview um, on the BEB podcast from Going Broke Twice to doing over 5 million in government contracts. Just kind of share my story, and it's the reverse where someone interviews me. Mary Korn from Social Worker to Experience Businesswoman um, went out, built up a humongous um, staffing firm. Um, she's actually, I'm sorry, not staffing. Uh, she does contact centers. And so she's got over a thousand employees. That was her goal. She hit that. And she's, I think she's at 1,200 plus employees now in contact centers. Andy Wells is one of those guys that I talked about that I interviewed prior to the podcast. And really, Andy uh, just came on and he was a tribal uh, person. Talked about some of the challenges of the tribes and what that was like and uh, how he grew his business from $1,490 million. John Tellier, fascinating story, him and his wife, uh, you know, struggling and uh, just sticking together and staying with it. And then now they actually help uh, other small businesses grow their government contracting business, and they are a extension of your team. So great guy. Mark Masters, the man that fights wildfires, crazy, 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 used to jump out of helicopters, and now he is advising the government on wildfire prevention and also supporting them and their efforts. Jonathan Hart talked to me about DOD cybersecurity requirements great person. Uh, one of the persons who heard the podcast and the, a student reaching out to Jonathan and just kind of, this is kind of a, like a warm hearted story about Jonathan. One of the students uh, from the podcast actually reached out to Jonathan and um, asked him for an internship. Jonathan gave him an internship. He needed to graduate. When he graduated, uh, H2L gave him a job. And uh, so now he is working at the company. So just amazing. Sean Hartman, I applaud him. Uh, he was an employee of GSA, and he was able to come on and talk about what GSA customer service director position was and what that meant. So again, that's the next cohort of persons. And let's jump into 42, Lori Sales, Chicago native, Marine woman. Uh, Lori, you know, we talk about, she, she looked at, uh, she, you know, she worked in government, came from uh, supporting government to actually coming out and launching her own business. And she shares some of the situations that women even deal with, even after being successful in this industry, uh, what are some of the challenges that they face? In addition to growing your business and building a business, other things that you know, you've know you got to face. Louis de la Cruz started out, 8A company, did a joint venture with some really a national firm, did some really large projects, gained a bunch of experience from that, and then took off from there. What I love about this guy is his name was Andale. Is this company's called Andale Construction, and he got it because people also say Andale, Andale uh, to him. So I thought that was really cool. Michelle Early, uh, former IT program manager, built her own brand, grew that up, and again, um, just been an inspiration to women um, and women businesses in the IT sector. Uh, she's just killing it. Regis, uh, this was interesting because Regis uh, came to me with some some negative energy and some negative mindset. And I kind of reshaped that. And I talked about his stories of how he grew his uh, consulting business after changing his mindset. So really, really uh, good episode. Fascinating guy. Uh, Chris Dombach, you know, Marine veteran, goes out and uh, starts off by cutting grass. And now he's got this multi-million dollar landscape business that has just ballooned ever since. And so, again, uh, Chris and I, you know, he's big on social media. I see him all the time on there. And so uh, really look at all the things he's doing. He's got a fascinating story. And again, we're just talking about things like landscaping. And these are industries that, you know, a lot of people that listen to my show are interested in doing. Um, so I, I hope that they're reaching out and listening to these kind of episodes. Uh, Senator Garcia, former chair of SCORE. If you don't know SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives, uh, they're one of those organizations that the government um, that are available to small businesses. So we talk about his experience at SCORE. He's also an attorney. Um, and so he's seen a lot of small businesses where they struggle, and we go through all of that and more in this episode. 48, Dr. Joseph Grant, uh, retired NASA uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate. We talk about uh, SBIRs, STDRs, TTRs, and how all that shapes out. Dalali, 
My man Delali, let me tell you, uh, I'm so happy to have him on here. He had just crossed the 100 employee mark. Since then, he's went on to be one of the uh, force to be reckoned with for IT companies. Actually, he helped build some of the SBA's website that you currently see. His people did it. It's part of a consortium of other small businesses who are supporting our government. And so, again, all of that and more in this particular episode. My man, Doc Wright over here, episode 50. I tell you, Doc Wright, um, founder of Vets to PM. This guy is so energetic. Like he's like one of those kind of guys. But really, he's definitely helping veterans transition. He talks about the needs and how he helps veterans become project managers and come into the real world and translate their uh, their language and working as a military person into how those uh, translate those into project management type skills. So he's great at that. Nicole Tripodi came on. She's a government contract and small business coach. Uh, I love it. She was starting her own organization, came on here and really just gave us a snapshot into some of the, the tools that she uses to help small businesses. And now she was launching her own coaching business. And so I, I was able to help her um, and, and that. But also she was able to show us some of the insight tricks and how she was able to pull data from some of the commonly used websites out there. Stacey Redman, she actually was a mentor to some of my other podcast guests. So a lot of people looked up to her, woman in IT, philanthropist, veteran, and she continues to reinvent herself. Stephen Hallisnick, serial entrepreneur, uh, he teaches companies how to build $10 million revenue businesses. And so he was also a part of EO, which is the organization that I'm in. And so again, where we talk about with other serial entrepreneurs. Chris, my man Chris, former acquisition policy advisor, very similar to Janetta Brewer. Uh, he's also been an attorney for the government, expert witness, and written a book on uh, government contracting. So again, follow Chris. And then uh, Sonia. Sonia actually ANC. So she was my first guest that worked at a tribal company. And she also um, talks, she's in IT. She, her specialty is IT. Um, but she's uh, done her own series of webinars. And so again, just seeing how she put herself out there was incredible. Margot Dorfman, U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce, a fascinating story about some of the struggles of starting the U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce and what that was like and how she got started with that. My man, Eli Smith, again, another black proud business owner, talks about some of the reasons why you don't want to do state and local and why federal is better. Uh, he's just been, you know, built out multiple businesses that have been successful and he's continuing to thrive. I see him all the time on LinkedIn. Renette Myers. Uh, how she launched her own successful firm. She used to work for her mom. She got it from under the shadows of her mom company and started her own business, so helping to support the FAA and staffing them with people and bodies. My man, Bobby Brown, Brocco Oil. Just, again, um, he provides fuel services and uh, he's helped with disasters. He's been all over the country and he ended up buying an actual rail yard as his home office and how that's helping to grow his business. Ramsey Smith, again, worked on the SBIR, STTR program. And so he helped engineers and researchers uh, find applications for the technologies. Just an incredible guy. Wesley Ross, most of you've heard them, a 16-year-old contractor. He's got two of his fellow students working for him, selling uh, masks to the government and other uh, products like uh, food, products and canned goods, I believe. Ryan Atencio, um, this guy was funny because he followed me on YouTube for probably, I don't know, a year or so, kept making comments. And uh, I said, listen, why don't you come on here and talk? Came on and we just killed it for like three hours. And uh, he really came on and he showed what it was like for the person before the contract gets to the contracting officer, the people who have write up the requirements. He was one of those persons who wrote up the requirements that then go to the contracting officers. And so he told us about that step in the process. So like I said, I mean, there's just so many steps in the process. Rick Grams, Rick Grams worked for multiple tribal companies, multiple ANCs. And so he tells us the experience of what it's like working for a tribal company, particularly tribal 8As and ANC 8A firms. Loved it. Uh, and he was very instrumental in helping us to have some of our partnerships that we've got today. Heather Blee, Savvy Link. Heather, Heather uh, it's crazy because Heather, again, uh, her story of building up her staffing firm, or well, I keep saying staffing firm, I apologize, building up her contact center firm when she was super young, um, and then it kind of imploded by some poor hiring, and then starting all over again, and then getting the government market and doing the same thing. Raj Sharma, my man Raj, uh, worked for one of the big 
uh, I, uh, consulting firms that support defense contractors, support the government, went out on his own, created his own platform, raised a bunch of money. And that's what we talked about in the episode. Danita Conway, Danita, you know, what I love about Danita was that she actually, uh, she does moving, right? So she actually uh, was, her story is remarkable because she was the person who said, you know what, I think I could do a better job than the people I work for. And someone said, okay, well then do it. And so we talk about that and how she said, okay, she saw all of the deficiencies at her company and she decided she could do a better job. And so she went out and started her own business to then do that. Patrick Heffler, family owned business. I love Patrick's story. Took over the business from his dad, didn't give him any breaks, didn't cut him any slack. And so he ended up growing at 10,000% and now he's doing incredible things. Carol Craig, um, I can't tell you enough about Carol. Uh, if you have not, if you're if you're interested in cyber, IT, space, satellites, listen to this episode with Carol because she really does. Um, she touches on a lot of this stuff, how she started. Um, she's right up the street from me. But, you know, if you want to launch something into space, Carol is your person. You've got Blue Origin, SpaceX, and then you've got Craig Technologies. So, again, she's really an open person. I love it. Lincoln Tyson, he does logistics and relocation as well, much like Danita Conway. Been working uh, in the White House, helped move the Obamas in. I'm sorry, move the Obamas out and help move several administrations in and out of the White House. And so we talk about all of that in the episode. Rebecca Aguilera Gardner, um, she started the VIB Network, which is a free organization for veteran businesses all over the country. 2,000 or so veterans in her organization. We discussed that. Marie Gill supports small businesses. Again, she's another advocate. And she uh, talked about a miss opportunity where she was running a program for many, many years for the MBDA. And she, because of a proposal deadline that she missed, she lost that contract. But then she tells you how she didn't give up, came back around and another opportunity came out. And we talk about that story and now how she is supporting small business in other ways. Teresa Jacobson, Alaska woman who helps tribal companies succeed. And so again, going back to the tribal and 8A program, we go over that in this particular episode. And Caesar Nadar, my man Caesar. I love Caesar, man. This guy is, is awesome. I had just met with Caesar this year. Uh, he's doing some incredible things in IT. And now he's built out his nonprofit organization, his cyber hub to support small businesses. Great guy, big time giver, loves small businesses, big time advocate for veterans, big time advocate. And he loves all the work that we're doing here at GovCon Giants. He's a big fan, supports the show. He hosts us anytime we come out that way. So great guy listen to about going and building IT business. Frank Spencer, he built his firm out in El Paso, Texas. And uh, just, I mean, it's it's amazing the things he's doing and growing. And um, so it's just awesome to see another guy build up a construction business. In fact, Frank and I uh, are having a conversation this week. Kizzy Dominguez. I love Kizzy's story. Uh, she actually, I loved it so much. She was the first guest to come on back-to-back episodes. Um, and so she made the Inc. 500 list several times over. Uh, she's As a kid, she was always like hustling. She talks about that. And uh, she talks about some of the programs that she creates for training government, um, the actual government industry people. So again, if you're into training, that's the episode to listen to. Brian Henry, uh, former truck driver, builds uh, his company. And so again, Brian Henry, really, uh, in that particular episode, he, uh, he sheds light on how he pivoted his business and what made him pivot that business. And again, uh, I think the title says it all. Judy Bratt. Judy came on and we did a multi-part series together. And Judy, really, what was great about that was uh, Judy came on and she was one of the people that I looked up to when I first came into this industry. The books, I read her book. I thought it was the best, the most well-written book in government contracting ever. And I showed it to her and I was actually nervous the first time I spoke to her. And uh, moving on, Rob Wong, my man Rob Wong, the former SBA administrator, Rob is, man, let me tell you, Rob dropped some, again, if Rob was actually, um, Linda McMahon, who was appointed by Trump, was the head of the SBA, and then she brought Rob Wong along, but he's been doing government contracting since the 80s, written a lot of the legal terms and the dialogue with the government contracting, and he came on and really gave us a lot of insight from the highest, highest levels about what it means 
to be above all of the 8A programs, the veteran programs and things like that from the SBA standpoint. So Rob came on and he just like turned things upside down. Making a Giant Podcast, that, this was the episode, first episode that we actually released of Making a Giant Podcast with Maria Martinez uh, interviewing GovCon Giant students. That's right. She was interviewing students who are now setting off and winning their first second and multi-million dollar contract. So that's our podcast with the GovCon Giant student, Chris Facey. Episode 81, my man, Stephen Coprince of Coprince Law. He's a beast. Uh, he's been putting out his actual newsletters and his blogs for years on the subject of contract law in government. Melissa Baram is our first PTAC person to come on the show and talk about all the resources that PTAC offers, all the things that PTAC does, uh, a great resource uh, for all of the government contractors out there. This is Making a Giant Episode 3. Anthony Clausen, my man Anthony Clausen is a beast, colossal contracting. He has doing some really good stuff in the IT world. He's a U.S. Air Force veteran, and he's, I mean, he scaled his business, the IT business, leaps and bounds through joint ventures and partnerships. So definitely take a look at that. Ali Bay, Ali Bay, cybersecurity, compliance. Um, again, it says here, husband, father, veteran, came out and he's working on some really cool stuff with, I forget the name of the agency, but essentially, I think it's Noah, where they're sending those balloon things up in the air and he's servicing that. But either way, he was the person that had the specialist and the knowledge of that technology, turned that into an opportunity, did a multi-year contract and went on from there. Wade Watts is with NSIN, the National uh, Security Innovation Network, and they are the ones helping bring new people into the government world that want to solve DOD problems. So if you've got an IT company, you've got an innovation, you've got an invention, uh, this is the place to turn to. Helena Moon, um, she's doing agile streamlined data management support services, very technical. But again, for those people that are technical in that field who understand that, that is the person that you want to turn to. Again, I'm not an IT guy. I'm not a cyber guy. But didn't we say that's the point of the podcast is to come on and show different faces, people doing different things in different spaces. And then we start repeating some of our uh, guests. Emily Harmon comes back on because she had so much insight and knowledge. We couldn't get all of that in a one hour clip. So she came back on to talk about mindset and positive intelligence as a government contractor, which for me, is so critical is getting the right mindset because all of this stuff that we're doing out here involves having the right mindset. Making a Giants podcast, episode number seven. Uh, take a look at that. This actually is really good with Miguel. He actually uh, went out, decided to go to consulting route. Find uh, He found a IT client partner. And from the IT client partner, was able to help them sole source a contract just shy of a million dollars. Matt Schoonover came back on, and we mentioned this earlier. He came back on, and uh, now he's with his own law firm now that he's representing. And again, we're discussing the new Mentor Prose program. Things have changed. It's been two years since we had him on. So we talk about all the new rules in that. Roberta Moore, uh, she was the person that I mentioned that also started off her contracting career in government, actually doing overseas projects. Uh, her staffing business blew up. Um, she was an uh, 8A participant back in the early 2000s, so we were able to, to talk about that and draw from those experiences, which was incredible. Mike Mello, ITA, which stands for In the Arena. And that goes back to a speech um, a long time ago Teddy Roosevelt gave that talks about the man in the arena. He named his company after it. Uh, he's been extremely successful in his IT business and was actually making his first acquisition of a company at the time that we gave this podcast. Definitely someone to follow if you're in the IT sector. We did a second interview with Roberta Moore um, because she was in some entanglement situations with some of her former employees. And I wanted her to come on there and talk about some of those fairs and challenges in the government contracting world. We, we love to hear the good stories, but also why not hear the stories of challenges and some of the other, the alternatives of when you don't follow your own process, procedures, and protocol. Ariella Wagner, actually, I know Ariella Wagner from my time as a construction contractor, and we talked about lien rights and protecting your lien rights as a construction contractor. Super, super important for people that are in the construction industry 
She is one of the best in the country at helping small businesses secure lien rights and ensuring they get paid. Sarah Dunn. So Sarah Dunn uh, came to me through Caesar Nadar Cyberbytes Foundation. They helped coordinate several podcasts when I went to visit him up in Virginia. Sarah was one that came in and she discussed GovTech Insurance, which is an insurance product for government technology companies, and also an organization she founded um, that she's called Women in GovCon, where they have a cohort of women that are doing government contracting successfully, that they get together and they talk about best practices and shared experiences. Joshua Duvall, um, he came on and we discussed the importance of debriefings and how to actually use that as a business strategy in the world of government contracting. Very interesting subject. Making a Giant 8, I skipped over Nicole Sharp. But Nicole, she actually, her name she her name is Nicole Sharp, but she is a really sharp woman. Uh, right now, uh, she is just shy of hitting the $5 million mark. I'm sure at the point of this episode, she's probably exceeded $5 million in sales. But what I love about her story is when she started her business and she decided she wanted to go into the federal government arena, she made that decision and she spent like six months of her time dedicating herself to learning everything and all there is to know federal government contracting. And then she dove in head first. Um, this episode of Making a Giant number nine is what we call Student Ash. She's a GovCon alumni. And what I love about this is the very first few minutes Ash discusses how literally um, she was attracted to me because I, I was preaching that you don't need certifications to win government contracts. And so that's what her attraction was. She learned that that was the case. And so she goes into how she grew her business and did her first $1 million quarter. And she literally sends me an email, says, Eric, if it wasn't for you, I'd probably be five years out here trying to hit a, a million dollars five years later. Judy Bratt, we decided to bring her back in the month of July. Uh, I thought it was fitting for her name, but we did a series of online live sessions with our audience. And so we brought those back where on the podcast format, people you need to meet, players and ladies methodology, how to get in front of your federal buyer and when you're meeting, uh, how to prepare for your call and get invited back. And then what's a micro purchase and how to use it. And then in between that, Elizabeth Jimenez, or excuse me, Jimenez, uh, I pronounce it like a, a typical American gringo, Elizabeth Jimenez. Uh, why small businesses should consider managed service providers. Man, let me tell you, I did not know the term managed service provider, but in my business, I always uh, hired like a third party vendor to do my accounting, a third party vendor to do my uh, payroll services. I just learned of the actual word managed service providers. And so we talked about that. Uh, her company helps small businesses be able to focus on the things that you need, which is actually running your business and all the other ancillary services, outsource those to the experts and professionals. Um, that was a great episode. And then episode 100, circle back full around, Adam Austin from Totem Technologies. And really, uh, that's the cybersecurity CMMC framework that is going to impact all of us small businesses coming up in the next coming years. And we discuss how you as a small business, uh, how you can set yourself up to become CMM certified or, or qualified. I don't even know the right terms, but uh, you can be compliant without having to pay a third party vendor to help you with that. So I can tell you that over the course of the last two years and doing this podcast, let me tell you, it's been a journey. I mean, where I was at at that time in my life and the people that I was working with and then fast forward two years later and now um, a community that we built that, again, at the time we didn't have, uh, we had a free course and now we've had over 7,000 people go through our free courses and trainings. We've got our paid courses that have 600 plus uh, people, students go through those that training and we have spun off other people that are doing government contract training. We have our tentacles spreading wide, spreading deep. And we're touching the making a big impact on the government contracting world. So these these are things that I can say for me um, have been really instrumental in helping me develop as a person as well. Because what it takes to to produce uh, weekly episodes of a podcast, I look at my man like John Lee Dumas who does five shows a week. Uh, I I mean that's just man I can't even imagine um, what that takes to do that. But even to be consistent enough to produce one episode a week across 100 episodes is a, a huge undertaking. And 
It's like what Jim Rohn says. You want to become a millionaire, not because of the money, but because of what it does for you and what the kind of person that you have to become in order to receive that type of money. So again, the same thing here with uh, doing a podcast and sticking with something to be consistent across the board for 100 episodes is it makes you become a different type of person that uh, really what it does is it demonstrates to the world um, that you have what it takes to to be able to thrive and be successful at anything. Because again, if you could stick to that, imagine how many people set up uh, their the New Year's goals and the New Year's resolutions, and within the first couple, month or two, they've already given up on that. They've already abandoned them. So, you know, I can say for me, uh, this this exercise has been really not only life changing in a sense of putting me in a better place um, in my career wise and my path towards. Uh, everything that I want to achieve and everything that I want to do professionally. Um, But it's introduced me to um, some extraordinary people that I've now become friends with, um, that I've become colleagues with, that we can, we actually have exchange numbers and we talk to on a regular basis. It's done all that and it's given me a new set of relationships that I didn't have before uh, that are literally tied directly to my industry. So if there's anything that I would say to someone out there who really considering uh, launching a podcast or starting a podcast, don't worry about the money. Don't think about it in terms of dollars and cents and uh, how much you're going to make from doing a podcast. Think about it in terms of being able to shape and design the next five years of your life, the people who you want in your life, the people you want in your world, the people you want in your space, uh, and being able to shape uh, what that looks like for you. And while, yes, there's the uh, cost of maintaining all this stuff and equipment, um, but again, it's no different than studying an instrument or a foreign language or practicing any type of good habit consistently over long periods of time. These habits uh, become like your lifeblood and they they become the chains that bond you together. And really, um, that's what's for me, at the very least, has shown all of these really smart people here that I have what it takes and I would make a great partner. I would make a great consultant. I would make a great friend. Um, because again, um, believe it or not that this stuff says a lot about your character. So, you know, I, I just want to thank everyone who's, who's listened to the podcast. Thank everyone who's downloaded my show. Thank everyone who's given me five-star reviews. Thank everyone who's given me four-star reviews. Thank everyone who gave me a two-star review because you did give me a review. Uh, because even the, the negative feedback helps me to be better, right? So even the negative commentary helps me to shape my messaging. Um, it helps me to, because again, I you know it's great when everybody's patting you on the back, but you don't really learn from that. So the, so, so the guy or the girl who gave me that negative comment that made me sit, can reconsider some of the things I was doing wrong. So I can tell you, like, I had the wrong type of equipment and I didn't have the proper setup and I had to get better lighting and I had to get better cameras. And so all of those things has helped me develop. And now whenever I'm anywhere, people always uh, comment on the quality of my production and what that looks like and how high quality it is. But again, it was an investment and it was things that I learned from uh, the negative feedback, not from necessarily the positive feedback. So I just, I want to thank everyone. I This has been an incredible journey. And now I'm looking forward to the next 100 episodes and what that looks like and the guests I'm going to have on there and who they may be. And uh, I'm excited for it because um, I only see us, because of now, these first 100 people took a chance on me. The next 100 people have the advantage of seeing what I've done in the past. And so now they can you know, make their decisions and it's much easier to convince people to come on the show than it was in the beginning when I was unproven, untested, and I had no following. So it does get easier to, to, to get guests because now I'm reached out frequently. Some people approach me at least once a week, if not twice a week, about being guests on my show. Um, so it does become easier to find guests, but I do very strategic and I want high quality guests. So I'm selective still in the people that I that I want to interview in the show and I want to bring on because again, I want to make sure they're a high quality person. And also I want to make sure they're honest as well and that the information they're giving you is truthful and that can really serve some benefit and add value to my listeners. So I thank you for that. I thank everyone for tuning in and I thank you everyone for being with me on this 101 episode in this journey. And all of you who have not yet subscribed to our channel, viewed our comment, comment our content, 
please do so because really we are, we believe that we do have some of the best providers of content on the planet for federal government contracting out there. And we want to continue to bring on even better uh, presenters, uh, bring a better uh, podcast guest, bring on better uh, guests, even if they're not in the, the government contracting space per se as the industry expert or small business, even if they're government officials who teach us about how to navigate their programs and their systems and things like that. So continue to share, to share the content, continue to um, give me feedback and let me know how I can improve. I want to take all that in and I want to improve it for the next 100 episodes. So thank you so much for listening. As always, it's been a pleasure to be here with you. It's been a pleasure to share this experience. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy your day. Stay safe. Be protect your family from COVID, however your beliefs are on the subject. Uh, just stay safe out there because I know that's impacting a lot of people personally. I've got some of my students have been impacted as well. So again, I just want everyone to be safe out there. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks so much for tuning in. Enjoy your day.